Hi everyone, uh, today we'll be going through a couple of approaches that I've kind of lumped under um, endocrine approaches, although many of these approaches are actually uh, fairly general and non-specific and actually uh, traverse um, multiple uh, systems. So strictly speaking, they are not really endocrine approaches, but um, for purposes of uh, structuring um, the sessions, I've chose to do it this way. So the approaches I'll be covering will be weight gain, uh, weight loss, excessive sweating, um, just a bit about the pituitary axis, uh, abnormalities, uh, gynecomastia, as well as uh, facial flushing. So the first is weight gain and obesity. Uh, I think um, a few ways to think about it. The first is to ensure that this is not just weight gain due to, to fluid uh, excess, um, secondly, ensure that it's not just physiologically driven, like let's say um, someone who is just having dietary indiscretion, uh, lifestyle factors of physical inactivity, uh, and sometimes there may be a genetic component, especially if it is about obesity rather than um, a, a stint of weight gain over a short period of time. Um, then we start looking at the medical causes. So I think the endocrinopathies uh, would be important. Uh, such as Cushing's, hypothyroidism, um, acromegaly, uh, PCOS, and insulinoma uh, as well for completeness sake. Um, also, because uh, the, when the hypothalamus is involved, uh, that may um, affect the, the hunger center, and hence uh, central nervous system lesions uh, affecting that area can also sometimes cause uh, weight gain mediated through an increase in appetite. Um, certain medications such as antidepressants, sulfonylureas, or contraceptive pills, uh, anti-epileptics like sodium valproate can also cause weight gain in certain genetic conditions like uh, Prader-Willi uh, and leptin deficiencies likewise. Um, I would say that the endocrinopathies would probably be uh, the first most important group to consider uh, after uh, fluid overload states uh, have been excluded. Um, yeah, so I think that would be uh, sort of my approach. And I think maybe the last thing to think about would be uh, instead of uh, just overt fluid overload, it can sometimes be just like fluid in the abdomen, so like in ascites due to um, other processes that don't necessarily cause uh, an overt fluid overload state. So next, talking about weight loss, I think it's important to firstly establish uh, intentionality uh, and secondly to look at uh, whether the appetite is preserved so in instances where the appetite is preserved, um, then I think the two commonest disorders will be um, number one, malabsorption, uh, or number two, um, some of the endocrinopathies like uh, hyperthyroid states, uh, DM, uh, pheochromocytoma. Um, if, let's say, the appetite is not preserved, then we are looking at um, some of the more systemic uh, disorders such as malignancies, uh, chronic infections like TB, HIV, uh, and um, systemic disorders that are chronic, such as chronic kidney disease, chronic liver disease, heart failure, uh, and so on. And it's also important not to forget uh, psychogenic causes like depression, dementia, and uh, anorexia as well. So um, excessive sweating is quite a, um, let's say, less common uh, approach. So I think it's, uh, it's something to think about, especially for the PACERS exam. Um, so I think the, the causes can be broken down into number one, uh, oftentimes uh, sub-acute chronic infections. Uh, so like in tuberculosis, we look for night sweats. In patients with uh, more sub-acute infections, like infective endocarditis, abscesses, uh, they may be running this, a protracted cause of fever with associated um, excessive sweating as well. Um, secondly, would be that of the hematological malignancies where there can be associated B symptoms. Um, so they may have uh, night sweats with uh, other constitutional symptoms as well. Then, um, quite commonly, we would, have, we would see the endocrine disorders such as uh, pheochromocytoma, hyperthyroidism, uh, carcinoids, uh, recurrent hypoglycemias that may present with excessive sweating. And finally, not to forget, uh, autonomic dysfunctions can also cause um, such a symptom. Next, we talk a bit about the, um, the, pituitary, the hypothalamic pituitary uh, and organ axis. Um, I think it's perhaps just to frame the context of when uh, we should be 
we should be screening for um, some of these uh, disorders as well as the different uh, hormones involved and their respective symptoms. Um, so I think generally when there is any suspicion that uh, one of these uh, hormones are affected, um, then our approach is whether or not this is a central cause or, 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 or an end organ cause, right? So let's say for uh, hypothyroidism, is it a central hypothyroidism or is it a primary hypothyroidism? So um, oftentimes in the history taking of station 5, you don't have your blood tests to guide you as to whether this is a central uh, or peripheral and therefore it is important to then take a history to at least uh, screen for the other um, hormones that may be involved, especially if it's a central cause. In other instances, such as if patients have, have headaches, uh, visual field defects, uh, when you are, and if you are suspecting, let's say, a pituitary mass, uh, or in, when they have very non-specific symptoms, like let's say uh, lethargy, where um, many of these uh, deficiencies, like let's say um, low thyroid levels, low steroid levels, low growth hormone levels can actually manifest uh, with such um, symptoms of like lethargy, just generalized malaise, uh, and so on. It would be worthwhile asking targeted questions and um, if, let's say, the history is suggestive to examine uh, appropriately and investigate appropriately for um, the different hormones involved. So for low thyroid states, I think most of us are familiar with the, the symptoms, things like um, weight gain, constipation, cold intolerance, etc. Uh, for um, for adrenal insufficiency or low, low steroid states, then we'll be looking for, uh, once again, general features of lethargy. They, they may be pronounced a postural hypotension as well. Um, if there's sex hormone deficiency, then decreased libido in males that be gynecomastia, testicular atrophy, uh, and let's say in growth hormone deficiency as well, uh, there may be, once again, uh, general symptoms uh, such as lethargy as well. Uh, so I think it's important to realize that uh, in the present, that there may sometimes be uh, one single hormone that is in excess, uh, such as in the context of let's say acromegaly, for example, uh, and the other um, hormonal levels uh, may be low uh, because of um, the the mass effect from the acromegaly causing a compromise to to the other uh, hormonal levels being compromised. So then we look at causes of panhypopituitarism. So I think commonly we are looking at tumors that can be a primary pituitary macroidoma or less commonly a metastatic disease. Uh, vascular conditions are also important. So in patients with a pre-existing pituitary uh, adenoma, they may suffer from complications like pituitary apoplexy. Uh, Sheehan syndrome is a peripartum complication where um, due to uh, severe hypotension, there's ischemic insult to the pituitary gland, and thereafter, patients may suffer from a panhypopits uh, set of complications. And also, infiltrative disorders such as uh, hemochromatosis that can be um, primary hereditary uh, hemochromatosis or due to iron overload in patients with um, chronic hemolytic anemias receiving uh, recurrent transfusions or less commonly disorders like sarcoidosis. Gynecomastia as a standalone approach is um, not common, but I think it's just something to think about at the back of our minds. Um, causes can be due to primary uh, endocrinological de deficiencies uh, in hypogonadism. Uh, hyperthyroid states, likewise, can also cause a, um, a mild element of gynecomastia. Systemic diseases like chronic liver disease, chronic kidney disease, uh, drugs of which uh, spironolactones and antiandrogens are notorious to do so. Uh, in male patients also, uh, sometimes, they may uh, mistake a breast mass, for example, as gynecomastia. And uh, in male patients, let's say with BRCA gene inheritance, they may actually develop breast cancer. And finally, congenital disorders like Klinefelter syndrome uh, would be things to think about. Um, the next, and I think probably the last approach would be that of facial flushing. Uh, I don't have a very good approach or, or structure to this, but I think about it in, in a few big groups. So the first is whether it's just physiological, so menopause, emotional flushing, exercise-related flushing. Um, second would be neurological, so autonomic dysfunction that um, can affect sweating, can affect flushing as well. Uh, the third would be basically high hemoglobin state, so in like um, polycythemia rubavera or in RCCs where there can be um, uh, extra uh, excessive hippo production resulting in polycythemia. Um, the next group would be patients that are actually just having a rash so that, that affects the face. So in, in lupus, in rosacea, 
um, I guess also in, in, in mitral stenosis where sometimes there can be this described um, um, sort of facial flushing uh, rash kind of appearance. Uh, and the last group, uh, what I think of as the biochemical mediated processes that cause flushing. So in endocrinopathies, this would include like carcinoid, pheochromocytoma, vipomas, uh, hyperthyroidism and mastocytosis, where a combination of different um, chemicals such as uh, histamines, uh, vasoactive agents uh, are, are released, causing uh, there to be flushing. And likewise, also in some of the drugs like serotonin syndrome, alcohol, uh, ingestion, these are, are causes uh, as well. And there, there are some miscellaneous causes uh, such as uh, anaphylaxis, uh, SVCO, and stuff like that that can also cause facial flushing. So I, I think what's important is to just think through the different kinds of causes and to just group them into meaningful groups that can help you remember uh, the various differentials. So I've come to the end of uh, this session. Thank you.